Hello, hello. We are here on the 11th edition of the Soul Buffalo Earth Report. I am super excited to have James George here from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. You're, you're, you're the head of network development, right? Is that the... Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, we're, he's calling it from the Isle of Wight, which for me just sounds like the most mysterious and magical land uh, ever. I mean, it's, it's a bit mysterious, but not in the reasons you might think, uh, you know, based on the south coast of the, of the United Kingdom. Uh, and whilst it is charming, it's it's not without its um, it's not without its interesting moments. Let's say being on a small island, you know, when everyone expects you to be in either New York or London or, or Brussels or that sort of thing. I, I want to. It's on my list. It's totally on my list. <laughs> Thanks for coming, my friend. We're super excited to dig into uh, really to dig into the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and what you guys are working on. So I want to just sort of bookmark this because we want to talk about it throughout the course of this call. Is that is you know, this huge uh, announcement that came out this week mm -hmm. with the Al MacArthur Foundation and the World Wildlife Fund came out with a joint announcement, which was a business case for a global treaty on plastics, which essentially is like a Paris Accord for, for plastics mm -hmm. or working towards that, which um, is just really, really exciting. So I want to come back to that. Okay. To start off, I, can you talk a little bit about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation? For those of you who don't know about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, Ellen MacArthur is one of the ocean plastic superheroes, invented this circular economy or, or popularized it, put it on the map. She, in 2004, broke the record for sailing uh, around the world and was knighted by the queen. And she's been on a mission to, uh, to make the world more circular ever since. Does that sum it up right, James? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the big handfuls, right? Like, yeah, we, we, we're 10 years old, right? We've been doing this for a decade now. Um, you're quite right. Ellen's, Ellen used to be a professional professional sailor, around the world sailor with a couple of um, solo circumnavigation world records under her belt back in the day. Uh, and it was actually in 2008 with with Ellen's last um, foray into, into kind of that, that, that field that, the origins of the foundation were established that um she's in the southern ocean christmas day 2008 2000 nautical miles away from anyone um and you know when you're on your own on this journey and you're at that time for her her boat was her entire world all the food the fuel the materials that she had were, were all that she had they were finite and and through the course of this journey ellen tells the story of connecting this idea of finite resource to our to our global economies so when Ellen got back to back to land at the end of that then 90 day journey, um, this idea hadn't gone away. So she started talking to economists and academics and CEOs about our global economies being built on finite resource. And through those conversations over an 18 month period, she um, started to understand this idea of a circular economy. The fact that our global economies are built on what we could describe as a, a linear economy, a take make waste economy, um, one that is consumptive and extractive and based on finite resources to an economy that could be restorative and regenerative and in its simplest form taking that 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 throughput linear line and turning it into a circle um, so following conversations with uh, teams at creative creative design blue economy rocky mountain institute industrial ecology biomimicry this idea of circular economy started to galvanize for Ellen. So yet in 2010, with, with four other people, she set up the Ellen MacArthur Foundation here on a small island on the south of uh, south of the United Kingdom with the sole ambition, the sole mission to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. And fast forward 10 years, we're, we're still doing that. Um, but the mission has remained exactly the same. Uh, it's a, it's amazing. I mean, what this, it feels like, if it's a major initiative around the circular economy and solving this plastics issue, uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation is right in the middle of it. And, you know, in the inside circles, EMF is how uh, is is is. I feel like in almost every email that you uh, that you read, which is incredible. I mean, tell us a little bit about what you guys are working on today. I mean, very instrumental in the in the launch of the U.S. Plastic Pack. Yeah, uh, we're involved with that, but I mean, I, it, it, there's a lot. So maybe like hit some of the. Yeah, there is, and, and and I guess you, your point is right. Like we we've been doing this for a little while. We do, we, we're working in some very key areas around plastics, fashion, food, finance, 
built environment, um, you know, looking at the, the application of data, looking at learning, um, making sure the concept's accessible. But the, I think the, we didn't invent circular economy. We don't own the concept. Um, we have our, our, our opinion and our vision of what a circular economic future should look like. But the key thing is that lots of people are talking about this now. Um, the landscape is extremely busy. Whether your metric is climate change, biodiversity loss, CO2 reduction, the, the overall agenda is out there. This is no longer fringe concepts. These are mainstream concepts now. The challenge obviously now comes about impact, scale, and starting to see action in the way these, these things shift. Um, we have been, as I say, our kind of headline areas of focus are around um, plastics, fashion, and food, historically. Plastics is what we started with. It's what people know us most for. We, you know, launching that report in 2016 with a statistic of more um, plastics than fish in the sea by, by 2050. Um, and again, then the update by the Pew, the team from Pew and ourselves and a number of others a couple of weeks ago around the amount of plastic entering the ocean will triple by 2040 um, with, with current directions of travel. Uh, you know, so, so there's lots of there's lots of complexities there. Um, but then looking at fashion, if we make fashion circular, we had the launch of um, or the kind of update to our jeans redesign project, which we've been working on for the last 12 months with 60 brands and manufacturers around the humble jean. You know, how do you make sure that those items can be fully recyclable and go back into the system and material isn't wasted? And we've just worked with some of the major brands around completely redesigning that to bring a million, at least a million pairs of these new circular jeans to the market by May 2021. Some of them are already out on the market, H&M and uh, Hilfiger and a number of others have already got theirs in, in the stores, um, but about redesigning the system around particular garments to prove a point. Um, but the thing what I'm, I'm most excited about, um, other than the report you mentioned recently, is I work in, in finance. Um, so we've been, working for the last 18 months with the likes of BlackRock and Intesa Sao Paulo, um, HSBC, City, Barclays and a number of others around how do you direct capital investment to drive a transition towards a circular economy? We've seen over the last 18 months a huge amount of activity within the asset management and, and, and capital investment market around folks disinvesting in traditional stocks and fossil fuels in favor of those organizations that have a clear uh, and you know ambitious sustainable and circular strategy um so we launched that two weeks ago about pointing to the to the value and our kind of main focus around that with our work with blackrock was that back in october 2019 blackrock set up a circular circular economy fund a very modest fund at $20 million. Um, and in the last 12 months, that has grown to $900 million. Game on. And yeah, and, and, and it's just been a phenomenal amount of growth in that, in that, um, in that group and uh, in that portfolio. And we had Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, uh, at our summit um, a couple of weeks ago, who said basically nothing is growing faster on the market at the moment than circular economy investment. And they, when we set up the fund, you know, BlackRock kind of, I, I think there was a little bit of kind of entertaining us, you know, here's this NGO with this idea, let's go with it, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. I don't think they expected that level of growth in less than 12 months, given the recent um, global economic shocks that we've seen as well. You know, we're hearing that all over the, uh, you know, all over the place. I, I don't know if you know Amy Clark, she's based in the UK too. She's with Tribe Impact Capital. She was yeah. on two weeks ago and we were talking about divesting how a normal person divests from fossil fuels. Yeah. And she encouraged me to go talk to my financial planner and find out exactly what was in my funds. And I did that and I realized that I had all kinds of investments that I didn't realize that I had, that I'm trying to figure out how to untangle. And I think that's like such so much of the equation is like, you don't realize that if you're invested in index funds or if you're invested in just generally, you know, in, in market funds that you may very well and most probably are investing in companies and, and ide ideologically ide in, in an ideology that you don't believe in if you're like involved with this. So like it's, it, it's interesting. It starts at the consumer level. And um, certainly Larry Fink, I mean, I think he's in like everybody's presentations because of the leadership that BlackRock is putting out around 
how important it is, you know, to be aligned with ESG. And that's super exciting. Fashion's interesting too, because I feel like yeah. fashion generally gets a pass. All the consumer packaged good companies and ocean plastics and you see bottles floating down river rivers and it's very easy to figure out who is involved and what companies need to you know, have their fingers pointed at. And with fashion, it's a, just as much, you know, so much, we don't know how much plastic's getting in the situation. If you're washing clothes in New York City and there's plastic in that clothes, it's washing out into the Hudson River yeah. and you just can't see it. So that's incredible work. Uh, so 60 different companies are involved in this gene in this yeah and, and i think one of the challenges with the fashion industry and, and 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 there is a lot of again a lot of interest within fast fashion and the way we consume clothes. i mean we don't physically consume them but you know what i mean as as consumers um there there's a huge amount of fragmentation within that industry so it's really hard to try and unpick or systemically unpick what is the problem um and also no one has a clean conscience everyone is part of the the current incumbent system that we see around us and you're right i mean there's some huge startling statistics um and you, you know things like a a, a a a truckload of garments are incinerated or landfilled every minute you know the average t-shirt um we wear it kind of six times own it for less than a year you know there's there's lots of these statistics and I think there's so there's very much this challenge around uh, microfibers as we wash and and and, and tumble our, our clothing and you know it's wear and tear then leaches into the water system. But there's also the manufacturing process. There's the the sourcing of the cotton. There's the the dyes and the, and the, the processes that are used. So I think when you look at that as a as a as a term fashion, it's very hard to potentially pick one area to focus in on. So what we look to do with the jeans redesign is take one one item um, or, or one, you know, like out of a basics range, something that everyone has in their wardrobe, the iconic gene, and look at that as a way of how you engage the manufacturers, the, the producers, the fashion houses, the, the changing consumer trends, but also the, the end of life, you know, how is that then sorted, collected and recycled for that material to make the next generation of garments? Um, and by doing so, and proving that you could make shift that system and how it works, that then hopefully provides a blueprint to then move to other items of clothing to look at how we how we create and circulate that those items that we have in our wardrobes, at the bottoms of our drawers, um, but actually do so in a way that collaborates across all elements of the value chain to produce a product firstly that people want and can be proud of and has a story, but also then ticks those boxes of answering the economic argument, but then creating the social and the environmental impact as well. So that's been the main sort of focus with that. And it's been really exciting. We we launched a little promo video this week um, around that. And like I say, there'll be more information coming in, in the first part. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll pop that out. Yeah. We can put it, we can attach it to this feed too. That's cool. cool. So on a personal note, what's your origin story? I know that you are, we're both former military folks, but people don't, I, I feel like your career was more illustrious. I was, a, I, was a, I was a forklift pilot, I like to say, in the Air Force. Paid for college, yeah. super grateful. Long, long time ago. Um, but what was your origin story into you know the, the plastic crisis? How'd you how'd you end up here? Yeah, I mean, it, it, thanks for that. Um, it's and I guess everyone's story is relative, right? But you know, mine mine is my story and and, and kind of how I went. I I yeah, I spent twelve years in the in the Royal Navy um, as, a, as a, you know, the latter part of that as a clearance diver, spending most of my time um, kind of uh, hot and sandy places, but not the kind of places that you'd want to go on holiday. Um, and that was a great, that was a great adventure. I loved that, that chapter, but like most ex-military personnel, he spent a lot of time away. Like there's a lot of separation from family and, and what's important or what outside of that, what's important. So I decided that, you know, whilst the game was good, I, I, try and find something else. And I did let's not, let's not move past clearance divers really quickly because when I, I traveled the world and uh, traveled with Australian clearance divers, just randomly met them. And so it's kind of fascinating. You basically yeah. dismantling underwater bombs, correct? Yeah, yeah, it, I, so underwater bomb disposal um, in various forms, you know, mostly sea mines, torpedoes, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, I was very fortunate that um, I, I had some great opportunities. Um, I had the opportunity to work with just the most amazing 
skilled monsters that you could come across who you know challenged you every day but they were there to support you and look after you at those those times where it got a bit kind of warm and sticky um but we you know i, I kind of closed that chapter because i had a great time but i needed i wanted a bit more stability and i i did what all good um officers do when you leave the military and you run straight to london because you assume the streets are paved with gold um, and you try and you try and sort of find your find your way in the world. Um, what that did teach me is that makes me thoroughly miserable, um, because what I ad identified over that period is I I no longer had a sense of purpose. Um, I had a, an income, I had a, a vocation, but I didn't have a cause. Um, so I started searching around for things that might reconnect me with that. And to cut a very long story short. I ended up going um, on a skiing holiday with some friends and in that wider group where these folks from this place called the Ellen MacArthur Foundation talking about this idea of circular economy. And through the course of that week, I told them my story, they told me theirs. And, and on the last morning, one chap turned around and said, James, I think we might have a job for you. Um, so two weeks later, I applied. Um, four weeks later, I, I was accepted. I, I moved to the Isle of Wight, which where I'm from originally, actually. I moved back to the Isle of Wight, much to the delight of my parents. Nice. Um, and, and that was three years ago, and it's it's disappeared in an absolute flash. So I didn't come to this with a background in it, but actually when I started to understand more and looked at the concept of the circular economy and the kind of world that we have right now, um, it made perfect sense for me. And there, again, was a purpose I could kind of align with and help drive forward i think so many of us have that sim like i we didn't come to this with a background in it either you know we were i was in delhi and doing a landfill tour by accident after a big expedition we were running five four years ago and then realized we needed to convene in this kind of space and it's just all of a sudden you know here we are but i think that's also talks i mean the purpose side of this i mean it's it's a mission and it's like one of the most complicated issue, issues in the time yeah. in the entire world but what keeps you up at night the most about this crisis or maybe a better way to frame that is like if you had a magic wand and obviously if we all had like a magic wand we would just there wouldn't be a problem right but like where would you focus like what is the issue that you know in this complex uh, I mean, that it, you would it is it's one of those existential challenges that if, if you if you think too hard about it it's very easy to become overwhelmed with the challenge that we that we all face if you look at how quickly, I, I mean, some of it is around how we understand the problem around plastics much better now, but but if you look at how quickly that curve is becoming exponential with the amount of material that's leaching into our environments, whether that be into landfill or into the oceans or, 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 or what have you, it is scary. Like how, it almost, how can we stop that? Like, do we have it within our power before it's all too late? And when you look at some of the, you know, David Attenborough's recent um, offering on Netflix. It was um, amazing. It was a totally amazing. Chris, I, mean, Dave, I, I it's, like an, it's like an hour and 10 minutes long. I watched the first 45 minutes and, and turned it off because I was going to bed. The first 45 minutes is the point where he talks about all the negative stuff. So I went to bed that night thinking, oh, oh yeah. my God, we're doomed. We're absolutely doomed. And then the following night, my partner and I sat down and watched the, the remaining kind of 25 minutes. It was like, no, no, actually, we've got this. We know how to do it. So it's one of those things around what, you know, in a, another way, I kind of, am I still hopeful? And I am. I am still hopeful, not just because of the work that I do with the foundation, but I'm hopeful for conversations like this, for the level of awareness that, you know, even during a global pandemic, we have seen so much collaboration. And we've seen dialogue at the highest level between business, government between um, institutions accelerate so much quicker than we ever could have hoped for um, previously. If I had a magic wand, I, I, I'd, I'd want to turn off the tap, right? Like the, cha the one challenge is dealing with the stuff that's there, but I would want to come back upstream and turn off the tap and get into a system that means that, okay, we've still got to deal with this challenge over here and we're, we're innovative species, we can do that. But how do we stop more flowing in faster quicker more chemicals more leaching that sort of thing so that would be my that would be my magic one moment i think that's uh it's interesting you know turning off the tap like and it's like when you talk turning off the tap of like virgin plastic coming into the system when it's like the only like it's such a 
it's like this paradox, right? I mean, I feel like we talk about this all the time. I mean, it is like right now there's not a better material and there's no, we're not even close right. to coming up with something that can replace it, but it's, it's, it's raining plastic, literally yeah. like raining plastic. And, it, and, and the rain is getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And, and, and as each day passes, that challenge gets harder and harder and harder. And I think there's, there's lots of great dialogue, lots of great dialogue across every geography, every industry, everyone recognizes the, the, the depth of the challenge. The real thing now is how do we draw all of that effort together to focus, to actually start getting stuff done, which I guess leads almost nicely into a segue onto the, the call out that we had um, yeah. last yeah. week, WWF and, and BCG around the, the UN treaty on, on plastic pollution. My phone has been ringing off the hook and I've been in more conversations about the global treaty for plastic kind of, I mean, and we, you know, we're convening some stuff in the U.S. right now. We have all the major, I, like they're like Chatham House. I can't really talk about who's there, but all pretty much most of the major consumer packaged goods companies and most of the major environmental NGOs all coming under this umbrella of can we put some legislation forth in the U.S. to help essentially pay for the recycling system to really make it more efficient in general. Um, they call it, you know, um, EPR, extended producer responsibility, where the companies that make the plastic or that sell products in the plastic have responsibility to uh, to take care of it when it's said and done. There's lots of programs in Canada and Australia. The EU is really like paving the way, but like we just don't have anything close here in the US. And it is so unbelievably complicated. So we're like working in this policy sort of dialogue where there's like opposing forces that have been battling for years. And it's just an interesting microcosm when you start to scale this out to a global treaty. And you guys put this, uh, EMF and World Wildlife Fund put this announcement out there. Uh, there's the business case for why it makes sense. So we say global treaty. I mean, we're really essentially talking about the Paris Accord for plastics. And it's just fraught with differing opinions about what should be in that treaty. I don't want to say landmines, but like, you know, there's, uh, you're the guy that knows how to diffuse those. <laughs> but I mean, what are your thoughts on like best case, worst case, what this thing could look like in the end and how we can, uh, how long it's going to take? I mean, it, cause it's like when I'm getting naysayers on the phone, they're like, this is going to take forever and it's going to be an incredible time suck. And like, it's, uh, are we, is it really going to be meaningful? And then on the flip side of that, people are like, this is the chance that we have to curb this 2040 triple the plastic uh i mean it, it is a hugely complex challenge when you take you and you zoom out and take plastics on a global scale notwithstanding like the issues in north america europe asia whatever it is you know different jurisdictions different culture different relationships with plastic different um infrastructures different methodologies of dealing with it it is that's one of the problems right the plastic regulation landscape is super complicated um for me, and I, I, when I, you know, was kind of first came onto this through my through my colleagues within the within the plastics team, um, my mind was instantly taken uh, to 1986. Um, I think it's 15th of September. Sorry, 1987. 15th of September 1987, and the Montreal Protocol, when we had a challenge with ozone depleting gases, um, hydrocarbon chlorofluor hydrochlorofluorocarbons, CFCs. And, and, and the world came together and it's the only time in our history that 157 nations have ratified one treaty, all, all unanimously. I mean, there was a lot of discussion. You, that was 1987 um, when that started. The end date for that is 2040, right? So these things take time. So I think the argument of, um, you know, it's gonna take too long, we can't, step away from the challenge because we think it's going to be hard and it's going to be fraught with you know difficult conversations we've got to do something there's a lot of activity out there we've we've seen that voluntary initiatives have laid a really great foundation in many areas but lack sufficient support they lack impact our own global commitment um which we launched in 2018 with the un environment to to have organization sites to be 100 reusable recyclable compostable by 2025 to eliminate problematic or single-use plastic, to increase the level of recycled content in durable plastics. Um, we have a thousand signatories to the global commitment, which is a voluntary process. They, they, they send their numbers in every year. We've got a second annual update report coming in 
uh, in the next couple of weeks. But even within that thousand organizations, that only represents around 20 to 25 percent of all the plastics produced globally. So, so all of these individual efforts have impact, but then the level of impact is not high enough. With all the solutions that are in place today, if we got all of those to work, all of the initiatives, we could reduce our, our impact by, by 2040 by about 7% of the plastics going in. We need fundamental rethink and redesign. We need something that aligns that level of support, that creates national targets, that harmonizes regulations, that creates stable and smart investment into the right infrastructure, and also simplifies the reporting so we can compare apples and apples. Um, so, so I'm sure there'll be those that, that think it's a good idea, those that think it's a bad idea. I mean, you and I have discussed before, Dave, you know, even in the, the work that we both do, there are those organizations that we know need to be part of the, the solution, but are also part of the problem. Um, you've got to take as, you know, as many people as I so, so raising that ambition to try and get that level of international support to look at how we simplify that regulation landscape, to harmonize the data we collect so it can be comparable, and to make sure we plug those huge gaps in the differences in infrastructure we see when we're trying to tackle some of these challenges only comes from raising that aspiration and that bar even higher, in, in my opinion. You know, I, I think one of the things that you touched on, and I love the way that the architecture that EMF and the World Wildlife Fund put out around how to look at this, like the reporting, like how do we find, like it, we're speaking 157 different languages about this issue right now. And with, like one of the things that could clearly come out of this is just like a global framework so that every country is speaking the same language yeah. and looking through the same lens. I mean, so I'm, you know, personally, as an organization, we're incredibly bullish on this. We think yeah. I, like at this point, it's like this is what's needed, because like you said, it's the stickiest one of them, I mean, it's hard to like put it against climate, obviously, like lots of overlaps between plastics and climate. But it's just, we need to come together as a world and decide on what this looks like. And slowly but surely, we'll be able to get more and more countries. I think it's like 50 countries are already like preliminarily like in favor of this. Like, how do we get the next 107 countries? Um, we're definitely seeing like energy coming from the environmental NGOs. They yeah. definitely want to set a very high ceiling of what this is all about. I think that's really important. Um, and then you know, the mainstay organizations that are dedicated to this issue are like stepping up and like, yeah, if it takes a year, if it takes three years, uh, a year to get it started and three to five years to ratify it, you, we got to get started now. Yeah. So I totally agree with you. And I'm, I'm excited about just this overarching conversation around this and what this looks like and you know, the stakeholders that can come to the table. Yeah. So, you know, our hats off to you guys for, for, for leading the charge on this. Um, and, you know, and then there's these other, you know, like Gaia, uh, environmental NGO and, uh, and Seattle, they have a uh, initiative that they put out. I know like the Nor I think the Norwegian foreign ministers have put out something recently and, you know, I think something's going to happen. So I'm just excited to, uh, you know, be at the you know be able to like help synthesize and synergize you know efforts on this so let us know how we can help you guys yeah i mean it's it's i think there's so much activity and we are you know i think we've been talking about this kind of tipping point and and, and seeing stuff shift but someone described it to me as um the world has not moved as quickly on topics like this as it did in 2019 and it'll never move that slowly again and i think notwithstanding some of the challenges we've seen and the, and the work you guys did around the report for kind of COVID and, and the, you know, the challenges facing there around ocean plastics, the size of, you know, Switzerland as a result of just COVID alone has created a, a kind of a, a moment of pause. But, but as we start to crawl out the other side of that, this big tidal wave issue is still there, it's still coming. Um, so we need to, we do now need to double down and focus on and, and hopefully raising it to the UN level, trying to get a treaty that, that everyone agrees to, could give that support, could create that, that regulatory framework globally, could allow us to have one unified voice about how we talk about, um, you know, the solutions that come with solving this challenge. One last question for you, as uh, time is, we could keep going for, I, I've, I, I could totally keep on going for a long time, but we try to keep these to a half hour. If you had to meet one person in this space, I know you've probably met a lot of people. If you met one person that's dedicated in the in the ocean plastic 
landscape that you haven't met yet that you or maybe even somebody you already have met i mean obviously uh you're working with one of the sort of heroes in this uh in this space but who would you meet and you can't say david attenborough because everybody says that <laughs> i mean it would be great right and you know just to, to kind of have that moment um it's a really tough one and i, and I don't want to give like a, a kind of stock answer i think it wouldn't be one person it, i would want to take the CEOs of like the five largest plastic producers on the planet and sit them down and ask them their opinion on what they see out the window today and, and whether they think that is something that they want to leave as their as their legacy. I, I think I would like to understand because the challenge I always have sometimes is you, you talk to these large global organizations um, about the way they can shift their business models, where they can do things differently but they're still churning out tons and ton millions of tons of plastic every year. And, and I'm not always convinced that what's being said over here is not being lobbied against over here. Um, so I would want to kind of sit those folks down and just say, come on, tell me your thinking about how what you're saying matches up with what you're doing. We might be able to help out with that. I'll, uh, <laughs> put a few calls in. That's I, I like that answer. Thank you for the creativity. Anyway, we are uh, we are just about out of time. Uh, I want to thank James George, who the network development lead at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, for joining us today. Uh, I also want to talk. We have uh, incredible guests next Tuesday. Is Marcus Erickson, who's the founder of Five Gyres. He sailed from L.A. to Hawaii on a, on a junk raft, and that was sort of uh, one of his first. Uh, initiatives, but he's done, he was our expedition leader in the middle of the Atlantic last year, and he's done more expeditions in the five gyres than anyone else out there. Incredible guy. Uh, he used to work for Captain Charlie Moore. And then Thursday, we have Keith Harrison and Andrew Linebarger from the recycling partnership here in the U.S. Um, on the Soul Buffalo Earth Report. So um, thanks so much, James. I really appreciate it. No, thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Been, I really enjoyed the conversation and keep doing the great work you're doing. All right, tip right back at you. Anyway, have a great day, everybody.